It's been a while since I've seen a film that not only throws an emotional twist at you, but lays out secrets throughout the entire film that broadens its themes beyond your first viewing. And that's why I personally believe that Denny, it's hard to pronounce his name, but you better know it, is one of the best directors working today. Because while many films may seem slow and pretentious, this dude always assures me that even if the audience doesn't pick up on everything, he knows and has a purpose for every shape, color, spider, and camera movement in his films. It's never the artsy-fartsy cop-out of, uh, well, you know, it's, uh, it's up to you to decide the meaning. He knows the purpose for everything, and he leaves you to contemplate how you would react. And with Arrival, it's absolutely no different. However, with a movie like this, in order to explain the ending, we have to start with the beginning which is also kind of the ending. So for those of you who don't understand that the title is already a spoiler warning, spoiler warning, because we're about to cover a whole lot. So let's start with the quick breakdown. We meet Louise, which is funny because Adams is no stranger to aliens when she plays Lois, who's having glimpses of her daughter's birth, life, and ultimate death to cancer. We see that she's a linguistic teacher at a university and follow her on the day in which the aliens arrive. And they land in these contact-looking ships parked in 12 different locations around the world. She eventually gets chosen in the middle of the night without even a courtesy text to help decode their language since her and the King of Scotland worked together in the past. On the trip, she meets Mr. Scientist Ian and they both fall head over heels, literally, since the spaceship defies gravity. They spend about a month trying to communicate with these octo-hand-looking aliens and focus on writing rather than open speech. During this time, Louise consistently blanks out getting these glimpses of her daughter and looking like a still from a That's So Raven episode. However, while they are making some progress, a couple of soldiers decide to place a bomb on the ship because they're scared, and the whole world is also depending on China to not start the beginning of Independence Day with these aliens. Things start to get tense until the aliens send a pod for Luis, since aliens seem to really like Amy Adams. And in the worst CGI of the movie, they reveal the big twist. Their circular-looking language actually deals with time. And those raven Simone visions she's been having are of her future. The aliens also disclose that they can see, not necessarily travel, into the future, and that in 3,000 years, they're gonna need us we little humans' help. You know, if we don't all kill each other by then. So while juggling with the fact that she now knows her future, and how her eventual daughter will die, Luis goes all Bran Stark and finds a way to stop China. In a scene taking place 18 months later, we see the Chinese president come up to her and reveal how he convinced her that day in the present by finding his private number, which he gives her in the future, reciting his wife's last words to convince him, which he gives her in the future, and warning him to stop. It is a time paradox, but it still works out because she calls him up, luckily they don't have cricket, he gets the message, retreats, and peace is made. Ian then gives the most lactose-filled line of the year, which went along the lines of meeting the aliens doesn't compare to meeting you. And, well, I guess that line worked because they end up having a baby. However, Louise, who can communicate with aliens, doesn't know how to communicate with her own husband and informs Ian after having the baby that she knows baby Hannah is going to die of cancer, which of course angers him to leave, and then we end up in the beginning of the movie. So, let's break down everything else into four parts. The major theme of the film is obviously about communication. That's also present in Ted Chiang's short story, which inspired the film, who's also written a bunch of other shorts that, guess what, have to do with communication. The studio even released a short showing people who spoke different languages meeting each other and finding ways that they connected to break that barrier and learn to communicate. In the film, we see the aliens land in 12 different spots around the world, forcing each nation to go through that Dark Knight Joker boat scene where they have to hope that the other country doesn't go berserk and ruin all the work they've done. I also love how the movie emphasizes on talking things out before fighting, considering the superhero stars involved who ignore that in their other films. But what's also cool is the Supper Wolf theory they bring up, which states that we perceive things differently depending on the language we know and the culture from which it's spoken. 
Imagine, if you will, the Latin languages and how they're perceived to be more romantic by nature. And imagine the aliens' languages and how it correlates with time. The film, however, also stresses a different form of communication. It's no doubt that the shape of the spaceships were somewhat inspired by the monolith from 2001, which many theorize represents the screen from which we're watching the film, and how that technology can open our eyes. And considering the aliens have come to share their technology with a restless world, cinematographer Bradford Young repeats several shots that imitate eyes opening with its framing, and the fact that the ship looks like a freaking contact lens that I'd say all point to them telling you, open your eyes. Because as we know, with the ending, the solution was always there. And the symbolism doesn't stop there. Without getting all Illuminati exposed on you, I do believe that, all propaganda aside, filmmakers can use symbols and shapes as a way to tell their story without having sold their soul. And then he takes a lot from Kubrick, as we already stated. Just like Clockwork Orange examined the idea of mind control and what many know as MK Ultra, then he does the same with the random birdcage that's present during the interviews. A callback to the infamous Project Bluebird and a way to visually show Luis breaking out of that cage in order to make progress and not follow the government's destructive path to think on her own. With the heptapods, who are actually cousins to Finding Dory's Hank, in case that ever makes it to the Pixar theory, also have meaning when it comes to their designs. Not only is there a funny little homage to the ending of Denny's previous film, Enemy, which you should all see, but they also have their tentacle tentacles shaped in reference to the star of Ishtar. Now, before you tell me to go take my crazy pills and put on my tinfoil hat, remember the influences from Kubrick and how he's used it before and how even Denny tattooed it on Gyllenhaal's neck for his movie, Prisoners. The symbol of fertility, love, war, and power. There's a reason why it's there. But possibly the greatest symbol and the biggest spoiler was the one that we were looking at and literally studying the entire time. Their language. We know that learning their language gives Luis the ability to be able to see into the future, but we also see that entire sentences can be created in one swoop. A swoop that resembles an Ouroboros, the ancient Greek symbol of a snake eating itself that represents infinity and has been brought up in a lot of other time travel-ish movies. It's practically the symbol for a time paradox since it's like this dog chasing the ball. It just goes around in circles with no end. But this paradox can also get tricky when it comes to beginnings and endings. With time being a factor in communicating with the aliens and in the second half just going all season 3 of Lost with those flash forwards, you can bet that they left you clues throughout. We get palindromes from Hannah's name, which can be spelled forwards and backwards and still be the same, to even the release date of the movie being 11-11. What's crazy is that they could have chosen any other double dates, but chose 11 because it esoterically means illumination, awareness, and being able to see beyond the norm. Hence, Eleven from Stranger Things and how she interacts with the Upside Down to Amy Adams going beyond and looking into the fourth dimension of time. You could bring up that she was having visions before she meets the aliens, but that could also be explained by it literally just being the narration from the ending edited into the beginning. But the part that really fails for me is how Ian learns the language but can't see anything in the future because I guess he would have seen that his Bourne movie would have failed. Finally, there's the arrival of coming to this knowledge and having to act upon it. It can open up the discussion of free will and whether knowing your future makes you predestined if you can't change it. If time paradoxes would even make any of this possible, considering the scene where the Chinese president would have never given her the info unless she already had it in the present, giving him the opportunity for that to be a reality. But you know, the movie knows this, that it's just a tool. The movie's just a language. The movie's just the monolith being used to open our minds. It's a good story. Thanks. It's not true. But it proves my point. The point of the film is to make you ask yourself, 
If we all had to come together for the greater good, would we? If there's a chance we can talk things out, should we? Many ask the question, would you like to know when or how you die? But not many ask if you'd like to know how you'd live. Because as we see in the movie, even though Luis knows that her daughter will die from cancer, she also knows the years of love she wouldn't give up and knows that her arrival is more important than her departure.